Good evening. Today is Monday, June 11th. It's our school board meeting here in room C350. We are going to um, read aloud the agenda and uh, have some adjustments. Um, the discussion items, in, we have our call to order, approval of agenda, the superintendent's report, discussion items, AT PPS annual update, children first annual update, fiscal year 19 budget discussion, summer construction project review, ties resolution discussion, the St. Louis Park long-term deferred maintenance 10 year plan discussion, intermediate school district 287 long-term facility plan request for approval, policy development first reading of policies 524 internet acceptable use, 806 crisis, and 807 health and safety. Uh, item I, policy development, second reading of policies 528, student, parental, family, and marital status non-discrimination. 529, staff notification of violent behavior by students. 532, use of peace officers and crisis teams to remove students with IEPs from school grounds. Item J, policy development, fourth reading, gender inclusion. Our action agenda includes policy development, approval of second reading of policies 528, student, parental, family, and marital status non-discrimination. 529, staff notification of violent behavior by students. 532, use of peace officers and crisis teams to remove students with IEPs from school grounds. Item B, policy development, approval of fourth reading of policy 536, gender inclusion. Item C, approval of ties resolution. Item D, approval of employment contract directors 2018 through 2020. Item E, approval of employment contract professional employee group 2018 through 2020. Approval of employment contract supervisor management group for 2018-2020. Approval of intermediate district 287 long-term facility plan. Approval of uh, SLP long-term deferred maintenance 10 year plan. Communications and transmittals and Adjournment. Um, we are going to have an addendum to this agenda. Discussion item D, summer construction projects and bid approval. And action item I, approval of summer construction projects bid approval. Is there a motion to approve the agenda as amended? So moved. Moved by Jim Benneke, but I believe we have um, another thing we want to do. Uh, yes, Chair Waters, if, um, if I may, I would like to ask to amend the agenda, or I would move to amend the agenda respectfully because of the size of our audience here tonight and what I believe they may be here for. I would like to move um, discussion item J to the top of our agenda to be discussion item A. And then I would also like to move action item agenda number Oh, which one is that B to um, to happen right after that discussion item so that we are effectively splitting up our action agenda into two pieces so that everything concerning the gender um, inclusion policy can happen initially up front. So is there um, everyone understands the motion for the amendment? Is there a second? Second, second by Ann Casey. All those in favor say aye. Opposed, that carries 7-0. So we are going to move right into our superintendent's report. Chair Waters, members of the board, I hope it's okay that if this evening I deliver my report from the podium. Um, this evening for my superintendent's report, I would like to share three recent events that align with our mission outcome of all students will achieve the knowledge, skills, 
passion and attitudes to meet or exceed rigorous academic standards without demographically predictable results in order to succeed in their future. And the first event that I would like to share where we all had an opportunity to participate in last Tuesday evening was our 119th commencement exercise. Last Tuesday night, we had an opportunity to celebrate the accomplishments of 350 seniors, and we could have not asked for a better evening as the beauty of our school community was on full display. Um, from the student speakers to the Alumni Award recipient, Paula Goldberg, co-founder of the PESA Center, um, I saw in her core values present. Um, I did not know this was going to happen, but at the end of the commencement ceremony was probably by far my favorite um, piece of it, where families, so shortly after those hats went up in the air and were flying around, families and friends rushed the field and celebrated with their their, their loved ones who had recently went through the commencement ceremony. And it, that warmed my heart because it showed the strength of our community and it really showed, you know, that old adage that it takes a village to raise a child. And I saw a village around each of those students that evening. Um, you know, last week was such a tremendous week for me. I also had an opportunity to celebrate with students in our adult options and education program who received their GEDs and also students in our Transition Plus program as well. Um, kind of moving from students who completed their high school experience in St. Louis Park to students who are transitioning to middle school. I also had the opportunity to attend each celebration of learning at our elementary schools last week. It was great to see the excitement of our fifth graders who will be transitioning to middle school next year and to hear many of them speak about the wonderful experience they had in elementary school. The last event that I would like to share with you occurred this morning. Um, we had approximately 450 staff members, both teachers and paraprofessionals, participate in a professional development opportunity offered by Zaretta Hammond, offer of culturally responsive teaching in the brain, promoting authentic engagement and rigor among culturally and linguistically diverse students. Ms. Hammond did an exceptional job engaging staff and pushing our consciousness in the area of culturally responsive teaching. Um, the early feedback that we received so far from staff is that they really enjoyed the learning experience experience this morning and we look forward to our continued partnership with Ms. Hammond in the future. Um, I just want to take this opportunity to thank the board for um, the permission and responsibility you give us to lead this work courageously here in St. Louis Park. I know this morning um, three, and I know all of you would have been there if you could have, but three board members had an opportunity to attend, Vice Chair Gores, Director Tom Beck, and Director Casey. So I just appreciate your continued support, and I'm confident that as we continue to work and focus and really what I like to call um, increase our critical consciousness, essentially that's just intervening in, cur in, in our current reality in order to change it, we will start to shift outcomes for students. And that concludes my report for this evening. Thank you very much, Superintendent Osai. So now we are moving to um, discussion item J, policy development fourth reading gender inclusion. The school board will review new policy 536 gender inclusion as a fourth reading. The school board will be asked to approve at tonight's action agenda, and we already discussed we're going to take action right away. So let's begin our discussion. Uh, thank you, Chair Waters. I have a few additions that, um, and changes to some language that I would like to propose this evening in this fourth reading. Um, it's on page 178 is where I'm going to be looking in our agenda, if that helps everybody in our board book. Um, the first one is on the purpose. After um, all students of the school district, I would like to include, um, to specifically name the students that um, will be affected by this policy primarily. And so I'm proposing language that says, all students of the school district, comma, including transgender and gender diverse students, comma, and then continue as written. That's one. Do you want me to do all of them at the same time, Karen? Um, the next is in the terminology section, um, changing, the, um, changing the language on gender. Um, there should, it should read, gender refers to, or I'm proposing a change so that it reads, gender refers to the socially constructed roles, activities, behaviors, and attributes that a given society attaches to femininity or masculinity, period. And we have um, a, a correction of the, the spelling of femininity there. 
but then period. So what you're looking at in the black afterwards would be deleted, that, um, those next two lines. And then D, I'm proposing that that read instead, gender non-binary is an umbrella term for people who transcend commonly held concepts of gender through their own expressions and identities. Other terms for this include gender diverse, comma, gender expansive, comma, gender creative, comma, gender nonconforming, comma, or gender queer. Some binary people also identify as transgender, period. Is gender queer one word? Um, I have it written as one word. And then finally, the last um, proposed change I would like to make is in E, strike the original definition of transgender. It's actually not the whole thing that we're um, striking. It's just changing adjective to umbrella term. So it would read transgender is an umbrella term describing persons. And then it would continue as originally written. Those are my proposed changes. Further discussion, Nancy. I just wanna make sure since we, uh, our board book included three versions of this that we are talking about um, the, the same version, and uh, the red line version is the pages that Mary was just referencing, but the clean copy of that that doesn't have any of the red lining um, are pages 183, 184, and 185. Um, what follows that are procedures, and that's something that isn't what we don't vote on. It's an, an administrative function, but we just have it here to take a look at. So am I on the same page with everybody that that's what we're talking about tonight? So, Nancy, could you clarify for Jim what you just said one more time, please? Yeah, Jim, if you look at the board book and you find pages. I, I know what you're talking about. I just, you're saying leave it out, though. Just, make, just want to make 100% sure. Leave out the procedure. We as a board are moving the policy. We, aren't new, we are not moving the procedures. The procedures are something that the administration does. And the reason they do that is because they can move more adeptly if things change and they need to adapt them and they need to do other things to implement them. We can review them and make comments, but procedures are the administration's. Okay, well, I fully agree. Uh, I just want to make sure when we publish this, though, are the procedures included when we publish it or not? The direction of the board is to include the proposed procedures that were read with the first three readings, then that's, we would certainly be able to ad attach the procedures when we put it on the website. But if you're asking administration to review the procedures and have administration weigh in on all of them before implementation, then I would not, um, excuse me, I would not publish the procedures at the same time that the policy is presented to our webmaster tomorrow if it's approved. Sorry. Yeah, so, uh, Chair Waters, members of the board, if I can have an opportunity to address some of the discussion that's occurring here, um, I would actually respectfully request that we uh, hold off on publishing the procedures until we have an opportunity to go to, to have further conversation about the implementation of those. Over the past several weeks, um, you all have um, given me several assignments connected to this policy, and I would like to just um, take an opportunity to share some of the findings, if that's okay. Mm -hmm. um, I had an opportunity, wh where I'll start is I'll start off by sharing the interactions that I have with staff from both Minneapolis Public Schools who have, they currently have a board resolution um, on this topic and policies that support all genders. And I also talked to the staff in um, St. Louis, I'm sorry, St. Louis Park, but St. Paul Public Schools. I certainly talk to the staff in St. Louis Park every day. But the, the staff in St. Paul Public Schools who, who currently have a gender inclusion policy. And I, you know, there were, the great thing is that there were themes in both conversations. Um, in both of the, you know, both people I talked to in, in each district, they really emphasized the critical nature of PD. And I'll be professional development and I'll be sharing a little bit um, here shortly about some initial thoughts and plans that I have for professional development around this policy and um, what they emphasize is that it's critical that we start with the leaders the leadership of the organization and it's not just around the technical language of the policy but more about the why right so why is it that this is critical to us accomplishing the mission of our organization um, in addition to that, they talked about the importance of engaging communities, students and parents in the conversation leading up to policy development.
environment. I think one of the things that they learned, you know, one of the districts, and I won't name them here, but said if they could go back and do it, do it again, they would have done a better job of engaging parents, community, and students. And I'm just thankful that, you know, as part of the process that we've used over the past several months that you all have been extremely intentional about getting community um, parent feedback and student feedback. And I know I've also gone out into the community and engaged students at both our middle and high school. Um, something else that they talked about, and this was a theme in both school districts, is that there's a need to be adaptive, particularly, in, you know, Nancy, you were just saying this, um, particularly as it relates to the development of the procedures, because they said that all they, although they tried to plan for everything, that there were things that were, they were not ready for and that they had to be willing to lean into from a procedural standpoint to meet the needs of students and families. And the example that one of the districts gave me was just a technology piece. So um, it was connected to their student information system and their email system. Well, their email system didn't talk to their student information system. So when you know students you know, use their preferred name through the information system, it didn't directly go to email. So there's little things like that that I'm confident that as we implement and as we work through, we may you know, come across. But I know we're working extremely, you know, extremely hard to make sure that we minimize the impact of those unintentional um, imp you know, in unintentional consequences. So I would say overall, there were many other things that I have captured from that conversation, but those were the, those were the three themes that really resonated from my conversations. I also had an opportunity to connect with uh, Michelle Kinney, which was another um, piece that the board asked that I do in preparation for this conversation. And I just, w if this is an appropriate time, I can share some of the feedback that she provided. Okay. No, okay. Not at this time. I can share that at a later time. Absolutely. Um, so I'll jump to. I'll, certainly. Okay. I can I can hold off on that. So from a professional development standpoint, some of the things that I would like to share are connected to the plans that I you know, right now as I look at this and I think about what our current systems that are in place, how we could implement this for our staff and. Um, one of the pieces that I've talked to our Director of Human Resources is about is the online module, Safe Schools module that we use for other required policies, making sure that we have every staff member touch this policy through that Safe Schools module. Now, I fully intend on in the fall back to school um, as part of the Welcome Back Week and Kickoff, providing staff, all staff-wide professional development. Um, in addition to that, um, I plan on um, similar to what we did with the referendum this year, going out to each site and each building and really sitting down and working with staff around the policy, explaining the policy to them and giving them an opportunity to ask questions. Um, and now when I say I, I, I recognize that it, I will be there, but I'm planning on continuing to have conversation with local leaders in this area that can provide support and offering our staff professional development. In my conversations with the staff from Minneapolis and St. Paul, um, they shared several resources that were helpful to them and I believe could potentially be helpful to us as we move this forward. So just to kind of recap from a professional development standpoint, I would like to utilize our online module that we use for all of our required policies. Um, I would also like to do an all staff um, training at the beginning of the school year where we expose everybody. So this is the one time a year where we have all 700 and I'm going to make up a number, 89 <laughs> staff members. How, is that close, Rick? Plus or, minus 30. Plus or minus 30. All right, that's not bad. 789 staff members there to really make sure that every single person understands the why behind why we're doing this and the connection to our mission and strategic plan. Um, and then from there, go from site to department to really spend time with each department in sight and providing training around the policy, particularly around the procedural pieces connected to that. Um, and we would, we would continue to provide that training as necessary and really receive feedback from staff about what else they believe they need to make sure that all of our students um, are able to have a great experience here in St. Louis Park Public School District. Um, the next piece that was um, connected to some of the work that you, you, you requested that I do with the procedural policy implementation was um, names, pronouns connected to technology. So how could we ensure that students, um, if they had preferred names and pronouns, how could we, how could we influence that through PowerSchool, which is the student information system that we use. And I had conversation with Tom Marble, and who's our director of technology, and uh, Teresa Zangle, who's our 
power school administrator and you know thankfully um, there are certain ways that we're able to insert preferred name uses and this is just not for students around gender but this is for all students you know if you think about it there are many students you know Fred you know Frederick may want to be called Freddie well these are ways that we're able to do that from through our student information system so I was really excited to hear that we'll certainly be able to do it and you know thinking about the pitfall that one of the districts I spoke to had related to their student information system talking to their email system um, our director of technology has shared with me that um, our student information system really drives information to all of the different technology systems that we have. So that would be something that sh should not be a problem here in St. Louis Park. So as I, as I look at this, um, based on what our current status is regarding power school, I, I feel very comfortable that we would be able to uh, accommodate the need of our students and families from a technology standpoint. Um, we've, we, I've also had conversation with staff just about, well, what is the process that we're gonna use for this? I know St. Paul currently uses a document where they have students and families um, request name changes, and we're gonna explore different options to make sure that um, we're meeting the needs of all of our students and families. So, but one of the things that we're gonna do is ensure student safety. That's gonna be our first and foremost priority as we're working through this. Um, what other questions that did you have for me? I'm just wanting to make sure that I tackled everything. I think that summarizes it, and I can share any additional information at a later time and answer any questions that you may have at this time. Aston, while you're, while you're um, uh, talking, I, I know you've had some consultations with students here, and I just would like to hear, I know we've had some practices that have been in place, but I would be curious if what you could share with us about the student feedback that you've gotten. Uh, thank you for that. I, I would say that overall our students, based on the information they've shared with me, have seen, um, they've seen progress and improvement in their overall experience. And I think it has a lot to do with some of the professional development that has occurred previously. Um, they cited things like at the beginning of the school year, you know, their, their teachers really starting off by asking all students, you know, how would you like, you know, me to refer to you? Things like that, which, you know, I know is directly related to, to the work that occurred and from a professional development standpoint. One of the pieces that they also highlighted is that when they see or where they have issues generally is from a substitute teacher, um, being that the substitute teacher is not necessarily always aware of their preferred name and or pronoun. So that is problematic. Now, one of the things that um, we're gonna be doing um, next year, and I'm looking over at Rick, hopefully I can share this publicly, but we're gonna be, and if not, it's too late, so I'm sharing. <laughs> but we're gonna, be, um, we're gonna be moving to Teachers on Call, um, which is a substitute teacher um, you know, service and they have a very robust professional development program, and I believe that we'll be able to incorporate some of the training that we're using with our staff through Teachers on Call to make sure that they know that when they come to St. Louis Park, here are ways that you interact with students and you, um, you, know, you seek information about how they would prefer to be referenced. And Rick, I don't know if there's anything you wanna to add to that. No, and, and, and just, if you're watching in, uh, oh, that uh, chair, members of the board, superintendent, um, every single substitute teacher who teaches in St. Louis Park right now will be invited to be part of the Teachers on Call group that supports us, so it's not like it's a different group of subs coming in. Um, so we start with ours and then we augment with the additional people that Teachers on Call recruits and places for us. Yeah, and I think the only thing else I would add to that is that they, you know, they students that I met with and spoke to wanted to have the same experience as their as their peers right and um, believed that this would be um, a vehicle to help them have that experience and and, and um, which leads me to um, you know some of my beliefs about it and as I as I think about this and I think about our mission you know and I and I think about some of the language you know we're very intentional about including all students and we have language that talks about providing a safe and nurturing environment that energizes and, and enhances the spirit of all students and if um, as an organization we are unable to recognize the gender preference of our students I it, it causes me to question can we truly be energizing or enhancing their spirit because that's at the core of one's humanity so I I um, am in support if of the board if if they choose to approve this policy tonight and we'll do everything I can to um, from a 
procedure standpoint to make sure that it's implemented fully. Any other thoughts? Well, we've been, you know, we've been doing this for a while, so I just want to um, review for people without reading the policy because it's multi-pages long, but, but where we've kind of ended up from a policy point of view and then w when we have the action agenda, I'll have other comments, but um, this is not a, a Minnesota School Board Association model policy, so, it, so we were really um, creating our own policy, which is something we don't do very often. And um, uh, there's been a lot of work, background work from Rob Metz when he was here, from various um, uh, seminars that some of us have attended, uh, from work that uh, uh, Mr. Asai did once he came on board as our superintendent, to feedback that we've gotten from community members. Um, and, and adaptability, I just have to comment on that, because even the, the terminology section that we had in here that we were talking about last time we met, we got feedback on, on changes, and I think it is adapting, and language is adapting, and understandings are adapting, and um, that's why one of the reasons this, this particular policy has a comeback for review annually every three years is because I wouldn't be surprised if there's more adaption that's gonna happen as, as our culture, as our society, as our school gets, um, moves further along. And so we wanna be um, fluid in our own look at the policy that we have. We also um, included in it um, a reporting uh, procedure so that if, because there are gonna be hiccups, you know, it's something new and, and lots of people aren't, don't know as much as, as other people do and despite our professional development, we're gonna all work together to try to do our best, but there may be hiccups and we want people to know where to take those hiccups so that we can deal with them and correct them and not just, and hopefully, and I'm hopeful, Aston, that it's not just an isolated incident, but there's a sharing of where the hiccups are in case they're happening not just in one location so that we can all get better as we as we implement this. And I think that's the sort of the general changes that have evolved over time as we've looked at this policy in the last uh, few months. And there may be others that I'm not recalling here. I just think the other big change that I think we did talk about on camera maybe two times ago was that we added policy references in this policy to our other policies to say that gender and identity, gender expression are covered by other policies as well. So instead of saying, we have these other policies which are just gonna stand on their own, we're strengthening those policies by referring to them in this policy. Anything else? Oh, just point of order, will there be time for one more comment when we do the action item? So. So technically we're doing all of the discussion now and then the request was we would go right into the action and it, the action item will be read, we'll take a motion, a second, and a vote. And Karen asked for the motion, the second, there should be discussion again, correct? Okay. So. But while we're still in the discussion part, I want to make sure we get all of our thinking into this. Did you have something, Ken? Um, it's about, not necessarily about the policy. The policy is well done. You guys have done a very, very good job at um, going over it and over it so that it's as good as we can possibly get it today, all right? Um, and knowing that we're not gonna be right. We're gonna be terribly, we're gonna be wrong. We're not gonna be perfect. Either, we're not gonna be perfect. Thank you. <laughs> we're not gonna be perfect. And. Um, and that's just, that's just the nature of us, nature of policy, nature of human. So um, we will, it was good to hear that um, Aston is um, getting the procedures in place so that we can be better. Um, but it's, um, it's a big jump we're taking, so. I was just looking at my old emails, and we've talked about this uh, in the community and as a board going on for a year. I'm seeing an email from February 8th of 2016, uh, or February 9th, referring to a February 8th meeting where we started to talk about this with uh, some folks from Blake. 
um, and Rob Metz being our superintendent. So it's been a, it's been a long road and um, I think the discussions have been fruitful throughout and I think new people uh, both up on the board and the superintendent and in the community have brought uh, new and important things um, um, to our attention and we've incorporated that and as as we've said the the yearly review of this is going to be important as as things evolve as we learn things about it so uh, I just wanted to um, thank everyone for their patience and for their contributions to this I think we're in a good spot obviously uh, like I said we're going to learn and it's going to uh, evolve but um, yeah I appreciate uh, everyone's time and effort on this I think we've gotten to a, uh, a really good spot Yeah, the, the reason I was questioning about the procedure so much is I think in some ways they're, they're somewhat limited as they stand. I'm sure Aston will make them a lot better. Um, so I'm glad uh, in the policy itself, though, we're, we're sticking to the, the basic uh, you know, rights that the, the students need, you know, the right to be called by the, the name that they choose. And we're, we're guiding some of the essential resources where we need them. Uh, we're having the, you know, the, teacher, the teacher training and development. So. I think that it's good that the policy is guaranteeing the basic rights, and I'm sure uh, Aston will, will do a lot of work uh, to make the procedures uh, a lot better as we go along here. All right, hearing no further discussion on the discussion, we're going to move to the action agenda on this. Action item B, policy development, approval of fourth reading of policy 536, gender inclusion. It is recommended that the school board approve the fourth reading of new policy 536 gender inclusion as presented. Is there a motion? Thank you. With Mary's um, noted changes. All right. Is there a motion? Moved by Mary Tombeck. Is there a second? Second by Ann Casey. Any discussion? I was wondering if under the legal references we can can we take out uh, 20 USC um, the title IX reference I'd like our attorneys to weigh in on that up, right? uh, I would prefer not to um, if we can continue to discuss it um, when uh, it was Ann and I attended the MSBA uh, presentation done at their annual conference um, that was discussing some of the issues and Title IX is referenced a lot um, in this area uh, in terms of um, where the courts are and where the analyses are and, and I would like to keep it in because it seems relevant to the discussion in the greater community. But if you want to talk about it more. Yeah, I'm wondering if that, if that Kind of concerned. Yeah, it's a reference, but it's in there, you know. Is there a specific concern? Um, yeah, yeah, I think there is a specific concern. Um, I'd like to hear Aston's input on exactly what the concern is. Yeah. Um, you know the, the the challenge here, and while it doesn't it doesn't change the policy, but there has not currently been any Supreme Court ruling that states gender identity is protected under Title IX. So that that was the reason for the the question. Um, but it, and it doesn't change any other aspect of the policy by removing it. Somewhat. Uh, <laughs> this is why it's hard work because we're we're trying to understand every single word, every single comma, every single period, and every single legal reference. So we're human. We're not perfect. Um, did you have any 
additional thoughts, Nancy? Can I? I am, um, you know, it doesn't change the substance of the policy in any way, and so I'm fine with taking it out. Are we all in agreement with that? And Cindy's keeping up with that. So where we're at is we've had the motion, we've had the second. Is there any further discussion before we take this vote? Nancy. Yeah, I, I do want to, um, because I think it's kind of important that each of us who wants to weigh in and, and say why we are where we are. Um, not that everybody has to, but you know, I just want to say that I am in support of, of uh, this policy. I think we've worked hard to get it. Um, what we had to start with was good. I believe what we've done has made it better. I don't think anything is perfect. Uh, that's, that's our humanity. So I'm really pleased with the policy, and I'm pleased that Aston believes that he can implement it. Um, I think it's important um, that all of our students, including our transgender and gender diverse students, um, feel affirmed, <laughs> feel safe, feel like they don't have to, they have to worry less. You know, we all worried a little, but hopefully they can worry less and perhaps not at all about their safety and their acceptance and their support. When they're here in school, I'd like it to be everywhere, but we can deal with what we're doing here in school so that their focus can be on learning and being part of our community and um, becoming their best selves, whatever that, whatever that is going to be as we want for all of our students. And I don't want um, um, their, their uh, transgender or their gender expression um, to get in the way of that and so that's I agree with Aston it's about the spirit and it's about nurturing the spirit and it's about having a safe uh, environment for all our students and I believe that's what this policy is intended to do I believe it will help move our us along in that way and I just want to say how um, I thank you uh, to the students and to their parents and to their friends and their to supporters who have been patient with us who have come and spoken to us, who have shared your stories with us, because they helped us, I hope, do a better job for you. And I hope we continue to do a better job for all of you. Anyone else? Mary. Um, I am also really grateful that we are here. I think I said that uh, on our first reading that I was grateful that it was on the agenda then. I'm thrilled that we're here right now. I. Um, when I echo what Nancy says, that I'm really grateful to the students who lived our core values in this district by coming to us and sharing their experience and talking to us about what they need and their families um, for being willing to do that as well. I am very, very hopeful that what we are putting into place tonight will do everything that it needs to do. And I am especially um, mindful of the fact that because it's not going to be perfect, that we have the people in place to do what needs to be done to continue moving what needs to be done forward. So um, at uh, an event when I was running for election, we were asked about this a lot, and I said during that time that I would very much look forward to seeing this happen. And it's been almost five months to the day, just five months and two days since a couple of us took uh, office, and here we are. So thank you all of you for being here in support. and. Um, I'm getting a little choked up. I'm really excited. Thank you. Um, I, as I said, uh, you guys have done a fantastic job at getting this policy put together, and um, and a lot of things that that Aston and Mary and all of you guys said that uh, really honed in to my core being, and um, tonight. And um, it, it's really good, and we do need to support our students. We do need to make sure that they feel comfortable in this building as we teach them. Um, but you also said our core values, we have to stick with those, and um, my core values are saying, I, I just don't get why we need this policy at this time. So I'm going to go oppose. Any other discussion? Jim. Um, I think the need for this policy is very strong. Um, there's much that could be said about the need, but uh, one statistic that struck me recently when we've been talking about suicides is that 40% uh, of transgender individuals attempt suicide sometime in their lifetime, and that number drops to 10% of those who think they have a strong support system. Um, even though 10% is still appallingly high, that's a, a big difference. And we need to support our transgender and gender diverse students. 
uh, in, in St. Louis Park, I believe most of us have always tried to support our gender di diverse youth, but a uniform policy is still much needed to address the unique issues our gender diverse students face. Uh, the policy will drive development of staff training, give guidance on how we support our young people. It will drive development of system-wide procedures to ensure students are always addressed in the matter that, that they choose, which seems like a question of basic respect. Beyond guiding the development of our procedures, though, this policy will send a message to our gender diverse students that they are welcome and well supported. So those are the key words I want to focus on, welcome and well supported. Someone last fall um, during, the, during the campaign said, um, when you make decisions on the board, will you do them, will you make them with your conscience or will you follow the facts? And I am um, thrilled <laughs> and grateful for the hard work that um, allows me to say the answer to that question is yes. <laughs> I know and I support this so much in my heart. I'm, a little emotional. <laughs> um, and our job here is, as policymakers um, is to make good policy, um, to make sure that our policies say what they intend them to say, um, to make sure that we've gotten input from community members and from students and from families, um, to make sure that we have an implementation plan. And um, I, we heard from Superintendent Osai that we, we have a plan. Um, and then to, and to ensure that our policies align with our core values. Um, the number one, the top core value on our list of core values is that everyone has equal intrinsic worth. Um, I see your shirt here in front of me, human, everything else is irrelevant. And I think that speaks to that number one core value. So this policy to me meets all of my criteria for a great decision. I feel it in my heart and I'm so pleased um, that we're here tonight. Uh, nothing, nothing extra. So we actually now need to have um, a motion a second on Ken's change about the title language in the legal references. Is there a motion to adopt the policy with that change? Moved by Jim Benneke. Is there a second? Second by Mary Tombeck. Any further discussion? All right, we're going to do a roll call vote. Uh, uh, if our clerk, Joe Tatalovich, could please call the roll. Uh, rewind here. So there was a motion and a second to remove the Title IX reference. There was no vote on that. All those in favor of that motion and second say aye. Okay, that carries 7-0. Now we need to, now we need to. The amendment. Did I just ask that? We had 7-0 for nine. All right, so then we're gonna do a roll call vote on that. Just on, just on removing Title IX. Okay. Uh, Gores. Yeah, I vote I for removing just, it's a reference. It's not part of our policy and it doesn't change the policy, so I can vote uh, uh, I on that. Uh, Tom Beck. Aye. Morrison. Aye. Waters. Aye. Benneke. Aye. Casey? Nay. Tatalovich? Aye. 6-1. Thank you so much. Now we are going to call the roll for the vote on the policy with Mary Tombeck's suggested amendments. All right. Um, Gores? Aye. Tom Beck? Aye. Morrison? Nay. 
Waters? Aye. Benneke? Aye. Casey? Aye. Tatalovich? Aye. 6 1. Morrison in opposition. Thank you very much, everybody. This was a lot of work. Thank you, everybody. This was a lot of work, and we really appreciate your involvement with this. I think you're going to celebrate now, right? <laughs>
uh, to make sure that it's understood is that there are some federal pieces, but there are some really big pieces to that as well. And so with the ESSA, it's basically talking about how educational equity um, is the condition of justice, fairness, and inclusion in our system for our students. And the big pieces that I took away from that was that it's basically talking about eliminating disparities, and it's also asking for staff to look at rigorous academic standards that align with the college and career readiness. And so when we look at ESSA, the words that I kind of highlighted in there for you was that it's talking about the opportunity to learn, develop to their fullest potential, and we're talking about students. And so with our model, it's working with staff and the impact for students. And then we also look at have that prevented opportunity and success in learning for all of our students, and, and that's based upon race. When we look at St. Louis Park, even though we're part of strategy one that we'll be talking about, it's also with strategy two, structures and systems. And here with our mission, it's talking about as a caring, diverse community and how we're looking at putting our children first. And when we do that, we're also creating that environment, which is aligned with ESSA, that environment that energizes and enhances the spirit of our students. And in order to do that, once again, helping staff be able to understand how to move forward to provide the rigorous academic standards that are needed and also energize and enhance the spirit of our students. This is our connection to the strategic plan and strategy one, teaching and learning. So once again, if we're grounded in our belief that all students can achieve our mission, we're gonna look at our culturally relevant manner in which we're doing that. And so our equity coaches provide that uh, constant dialogue, which you'll hear more about, and providing staff that opportunity to unpack some of that and understand what does that mean for them and how does it impact our students? And then once again, the connection between ESSA, St. Louis Park, our mission and core values. So back in 2007, when we first started going down the ATPPS road with the state of Minnesota, uh, Governor Pawlenty at the time called it QCOMP. So oftentimes you'll see those two words, ATPPS, that acronym, and QCOMP, which just meant quality compensation connected, it's the same thing. So you're gonna see that in MDE script oftentimes, you'll see QCOMP. Statutorily, it's ATPPS, but QCOMP became the coin phrase. QCOMP originally was, a, was intended to attract, retain, to encourage teachers to take on challenges and then be remunerated for doing so. And I think I just used that word right. Um, Every day, you should learn at least one new word, Nancy. I don't know if you know that, but at least one word. Um, so anyway, with the ATPPS through MDE, you know, we're trying to foster that, that ability for a teacher to step outside the box, step outside of who they are, and become greater than what they once were. Now, ATPPS in St. Louis Park challenges teachers to do the same thing. We use it to build the skill, will, and capacity of teachers to change and to alter that systemic racist racism in our culture that's there, that, 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 that whiteness that permeates throughout our established systems. Now, hopefully by giving teachers a, another way to look at things through equity coaches, through discussion, through lively PLC discussion and, and, and embedded curricular changes, we can make the, you know, the achievement of students a reality. All students, not just our traditional, who's always done well kind of student. All students. Anyway, uh, with our ATPPS, we have this equity model that we've been working on fine-tuning since 2013. In 2007, we went down the road of instructional best practice. We used BILLS, if you can remember that acronym, Building Instructional Leaders. Well, then we had a uh, kind of a morph, a kind of an adoption. We adapted a little bit to what we saw as a need. We had to have this relationship building structure 
in order to get kids to do what we're asking them to do. We kind of went down the instructional path without laying the ground, the framework of building relationships first. Because it's very hard to get kids to, you know, take that challenge that the teacher is offering without having that established relationship first. And so the, the mission of our equity model is to help that, to, is to help us as teachers in the classroom reach all kids. And so with this equity model, we're looking at critical race theory. We're using courageous conversations through Pacific Education Group, along with instructional coaching methods from our equity coaches who come to us with a wealth of knowledge, of breadth and depth that we haven't had before in this realm. And we now have nine equity coaches, those equity coaches, and Omar Adams is here today uh, to speak about the work of equity coaches, but I just want you to, and I'm gonna steal something from, from Omar right now. Um, uh, every year, our equity coaches are doing almost 1,200 observations of staff, teaching staff in any given year. Every staff member has three observations. We have 388 teachers. And so we're looking at almost 1,200 observations happening in a school year. I started teaching in 1996. I had three that whole year. 97, I had three. 98, I had three. That was my probationary period. And then I never saw another administrative kind of observation or even an instructional observation until we started the ATPPS road. And now we're getting to a point where now we have 1,200 observations of staff going on in a day, or in a year. Not in a day. That would be tough. All right, uh, without any further ado, I'd like to introduce Omar Adams. He is one of our, oh, oh maybe not. I jumped the gun. I'll step away. Frida Bailey has something else. Thank you, Mike. So um, what Mike was basically talking about is, once again, <laughs> educators. Our educators that those 1,200 observations that are taking place is basically working with our educators on understanding, once again, what ESSA is saying as far as our federal foundation and alignment. And it's also asking us with our world's best workforce, which is a part of that, what is it that we are, are about as far as Minnesota? And then as we drill down, St. Louis Park, what are you about as far as educating all students and how will you make sure that that is uh, accomplished? And so that's looking at our strategic plan, kind of giving us a guidance on where we would move next. And each site has what we call a school improvement plan. And what each building does is look at how is it that they're operating to the connection of our strategic plan, making sure that our students, once again, are in the center of what we're doing, but also having courageous conversations about how will we make sure that that is happening, and then the purpose, going back to what Mike was saying earlier, with our building instructional leaders and our equity coaches, at the time when we had the split model, they decided to come up with a mission that would be able to give them a foundation on how to move forward in supporting students. And so this equity coaching model that we have is basically raising the, uh, raising the racial consciousness in order to, once again, have those conversations about making sure that all of our students are getting what is necessary and what is needed based upon our strategic plan. And so with that, Omar will be able to give us a little bit more information about what's happening on the ground with the equity coaches in buildings. Good evening, thank you for the opportunity to share um, with a little more detail some of the things that we're doing. And I know as board members, some of the older board members, we had the opportunity to present to you uh, what last year, there'll be no test. We'll just, we'll just do a, a real quick review. Um, and to the new board members, if you'd like to know more about what, we do, what we're doing, we'd be more than happy to um, provide some uh, training for you also. Um, as we have conversations about race, they're, they're difficult conversations because I think we're, we're really taught that we shouldn't have conversations around race, but yet race continues to permeate itself throughout our society. And this first uh, tool that we use is our, our compass, and we 
there's four quadrants here, and we, we talk about trying to be centered. However, people generally enter into a conversation around race, around instruction, around some of their practices within the classroom, in sometimes deep in some of these quadrants. So you don't want to initially have someone coming in in their feelings, and I start talking about, well, you need to do this, you need to do this, you need to do this as a coach. We need to sometimes allow our coaches to be within their various quadrants. So that's a kind of a in a nutshell, how we use, uh, utilize our compass. And if you think about a house, it's the floor that we stand on that, uh, that this compass represents. Another tool is our four agreements. And if you, again, using that house analogy, it's the walls that keep us in the conversation. So staying engaged. Sometimes when we have those difficult conversations or those conversations around race, we don't want to stay engaged. We kind of start to drift off and think about something else. Um, experiencing discomfort. Um, as a Minnesotan born and raised, sometimes we do the Minnesota nice and don't want to have that conflict within our, our conversations. Um, and I think speak your truth is, is self-explanatory and accept and expect, expect non-closure. Our six conditions are how we have the conversation. Now those are a little more in depth, so I won't go into each of those six points. Um, some of the things that we do as equity coaches, and I don't want to read this to anybody because I know we all can do that, but um, having our observations, trying to find out what the teacher wants to work on, giving goals, and, and what's different um, than some traditional observations when Mike talked about his is that this is a peer relationship. So we are coaching, trying to give suggestions, and really can work with the teacher, and they're, they're able to be open around some of the challenges they may have without having to worry about any ramifications from feeling like you know we're, we're supervising the work that they're doing. Um, uh, we have we provide professional development. If you saw the books that we have at our disposal that our supervisor Frida Bailey gives us, you would you, 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 your head might roll a little bit. But we have a lot of books that, that are at our disposal that we continually reference and have a chance to read. And, and we look at those books and, and the the training and different uh, uh, media sources to make sure we're really staying on top of of current practices. Um, we do um, team teach with teachers. Uh, working with them, uh, team teaching and or planning. So a lot of uh, staff, and I can speak to uh, one of the buildings I'm in, um, are really working to include some of the training that we've given them in their classroom. Looking at different things of, of that our marginalized students sometimes have to experience and how can we help them uh, get through those, get, get through those, those challenges. Um, like I said earlier, we did provide training to the board, and we want to offer that again if you're so interested or as time allows. Um, and we've, we, I, one thing I want to stress here is we have the book clubs that we provided training for, and it really speaks to the dedication that our teachers have. I guess I'm a, I'm a teacher too, but the teachers that come to that, that PD and are willing to give up their prep or willing to come in early or stay late to go through that training, which really speaks to the, the dedication the teachers within our school district have to make sure that, that our most marginalized students are being able to be recognized um, within their, their practices and instruction. Uh, we've also provided podcasts, um, which was another opportunity of, of additional PD um, that our staff is, is volunteering to, um, to attend. Uh, so through our training, our staff is really getting the confidence and competence to um, address racial issues that happen within their classroom and um, in, our, in our greater society. Another piece is as, as coaches, we um, are, are, I won't say always at our teacher's disposal, but our schedules are, are pretty flexible and, and rather fluid, so we're able to uh, meet the needs of, of our teachers when they have um, a situation that they want to want to process. So in conclusion, through our efforts, we are addressing the racially predictable achievement gap and providing best practice instructional techniques. Um, we do this for the benefit of all students to attain their highest level of achievement. And as a black male teacher within the school system, I want to be able to directly impact this racial racially predictable achievement gap. So my four and a half year old daughter hopefully will be coming to our school system and she'll have the same opportunity as all other students that do not have the same skin color, sir. Thank you, Mr. Adams. So we've, the, 
I've always, I'm, I'm, I'm always asked, okay, where are we going next with ATPPS? And I've been asked that since 2007 in different capacities. Um, the future of ATPPS seems to be pretty bright, actually. Uh, we do internal surveys every year, actually a couple of them, and those internal surveys continue to show that ATPPS enjoys a, uh, a, a support level within the teacher rank and file at a very high rate. Um, we believe that the conversation is starting to change yet again. Currently, we use an ATPPS rubric that's built on Charlotte Danielson, based on Charlotte Danielson, which is more instructional based. The conversations that are now happening in classrooms with teachers and coaches has become, they want to get deeper into the racial consciousness discussion. And to do so, we're going to experiment a little bit next year with six individuals in each building, each teacher, or six teachers in each building. We're going to use a, a protocol with those six individuals called CryOp. And it's in your board materials too, but culturally responsive instructional practice, essentially. It's, just, it's, a, it's a different rubric than what we currently use in ATPPS. This would have to go through a vetting process with the state and here at the, at the local. But it's, it's another avenue to get this conversation to go even deeper, which many of our staff are asking for. We know this through internal survey, we know this through internal da uh, data collection, and we also now have external data collection as well from e external sources. And uh, Prachi Mukherjee and Mary Busman are here to speak about assessment of ATPPS today. And so there are, they're gonna be uh, continuing our, our conversation. Did, were there any questions for the three of us prior to Prachi and Mary? I think it seems like a little segue here. <clears throat> I have one, I don't know if they're gonna address this or not, but I, um, with several of us, had the opportunity to sit in on part of Zaretta Hammond's talk this morning, which was just fantastic. And the people and teachers that are around me were really excited. I thought about what they were hearing in trying to, um, um, move from the on-ramp onto a culturally responsive teaching and drilling down to that. So my question is, are you guys going to be able to help our teachers implement what they heard today? Are you trained in that? Are you getting trained in that? Is that part of the equity coaching model or are we in, how are we integrating those concepts or aren't we uh, with, the, with the equity coaches? So the book study that I talked about, we've, some schools have been looking at Zaretta Hammond's book for the entire school year and, and are in the process of, of doing that. Now each building has different needs, so some buildings are a little further along than others, but we have a number of copies of her book and we'll um, start to roll that out. Just so you know, in each site, well, I can't say each site, most sites, uh, continue the lear learning today. And I provided PD within the building for us to have a chance to reflect on um, what she talked about and really incorporate the things from her and, and some of the other things that we do. Um, my belief is that it's not always the next shiny object, but it's a matter of, of continuing on the, the uh, practices that we've, we, we already have. Is, is what um, Zaretta Hammond's talking about different than the cry up that we're about to hear from? Or are they integrated? Or are they, do they intersect? What, uh, and maybe that's the next folks up can get to that one. Yeah, let's get to that one. Um, so, we good evening, everyone. I still have some questions, yes, though. Yes, sure. Because then, then I'll have to get okay. into your numbers. So, um, you read that? Okay. So, um, Mike, so um, when we had the bills, I think they did teacher evaluations too, right? They did teacher observations, peer observations. observations. Yep. Just peer observations, Correct. didn't they made notes, pass it on? Principal, they get Principals money. did not see, nor do they currently see in the equity model as well. The, the only thing that the building principal has access to is their PDP and the, assess, and the evaluation of that. But the observation piece, equity coaches, just like Bill's prior, that material is between the coach and the teacher, essentially. And I think what I oh, always liked PDP, about... PDP, define it. Professional yeah. development plan, which is the plan that teachers write at the beginning of the year, and then principals have access to those. If the principal feels like the teacher isn't pushing themselves well enough, 
then the principal can chime in. Then is equity in all teachers development plan? Or is that the personal development plan just made up by themselves? All of our PDPs, all of our observations are operated under the lens of equity. That is the piece that everything gets looked at. Now, so if I was writing a PDP, I would have to write a PDP using equity as a lens for my goal. My goal was to move uh, kids from 50 percentile to 60 percentile, but I have to drill down to every student in the room. I have to, I have to be very intentional in my instructional practice and my reflections uh, on who the kids are that I'm servicing. And so, yes, everything is built around equity. And, and I think that's what I have always appreciated about the racial equity coaching model because it is supportive, not punitive. And I think when we eliminate um, that, because it's already a, a hard thing to do. It's really uncomfortable <coughs> to examine your whiteness and your teaching practice, right? And so if you are in a supportive relationship, you have more incentive to buy in and then do the work. Whereas if you are only going to do a, a surface piece of it to avoid a punitive outcome. Am I right with this? Correct. And that was a big uh, issue that we had to kind of get past. When we first went down the ATPS road, that was a huge buy-in for teaching staff, that this material was going to be used for personal growth, not necessarily for administrative gotcha. Now, there's nothing that says that an administrator can't come into our classroom and, and look at us through an equity model for their own instructional uh, evaluation of us. But this is what we've done for our local with ATPPS. Thank you very much. Um, so we're looking forward to the next part. Thank you. So um, before I talk about the data from this year's end of year survey, I just want to go back to CryOp that you heard about from Mike very briefly. So that protocol is in its fourth edition as of 2017. It was developed by about half a dozen researchers. It's a piece of collaborative work and they looked at all the research literature on culturally responsive education and came up with um, right now the current edition that our coaches are going to pilot has um, six domains and 24 indicators. And um, it's based largely on classroom data observations, but also there's a component uh, that's a post observation teacher interview and a family collaborative interview. So um, data is collected from multiple sources because culturally responsive instruction is a lot about building community, a community of learners, a community of partnership with your parents. Um, so our theory of change with the racial equity coaching model has been that all teacher action or all human action is connected to their beliefs. So if we are going to see different results for our students, different classroom experiences, then we need to help and support our teachers examine and reflect on their beliefs. So that is the work that our coaches have been doing. And um, this is the year-end equity coaching survey. Now our model has been different almost every year. This is year two that we actually have only equity coaches district-wide, and we have nine of them. So, which is why you see results for 2017 and 2018. And um, those are the, oh, I can't see my response rates, but they were um, close to 70%, Mike? 75. 75 for 2018 and a little lower, more like mid-60s for 2017. Um, here is one example of a close-ended question um, set that teachers answered. Again, you can see the, the results for 2017 and 2018. These statements um, had response choices of not valuable, somewhat valuable, very valuable, and unsure. And there was also a response choice of um, people who said, I did not receive this, so they are taken out of this equation. And as you can see that 
prior to this year's end of year survey going out, Mike, Frida, and I met, and we discussed some of the questions, and you can see reflecting on my practice is not repeated in 2018, because we decided to break that up as we become um, more knowledgeable about culturally responsive education as well as teacher coaching increases, we can become more nuanced about that. So we broke that up into reflecting on my classroom instruction, interactions with students and parents, um, using data to help me understand my instructional practice, and then support and guide my PDP. That was added on this year, and you just heard about PDP a few minutes ago. So I have a question on that. So what, what sticks out to me is the, the response on using data. Mm -hmm. So could you explain why that number might be so low? Is it something that over time or developing a relationship or it, or it hasn't been the equity coach's role to do that? What drives that number being so low? So, um, you know, primarily an equity coach does not go in and start by looking at data. Usually, you know, like Omar was explaining, the conversation very much has to do with the person. And if you, Zaretta Hammond talked about this a lot today, about changing the deficit mindset that we have about students in front of us. So the, and Omar and Frida, please, Mike, jump in if I'm uh, misdescribing any of this. Did not use that word correctly, Mike. Um, but. You know, it is a, con a conversation is initiated to talk about race as it shows up in my life. If I'm the teacher who is going to be coached, then I'm going to be asked to reflect on, Prachi, what was your first memory of race? When did you become aware of race? Your ideas about how you teach, how you um, discipline students, how you give them feedback or reward them. When were they formed and what helped form them? So their data might not make it into the conversation right away. However, coaches will often do classroom observations simply to come back to another conversation and say, look, I did an observation, and for the exact same behavior, you treated Prachi differently than you were treating your white students. And oftentimes, that's a huge surprise for the teacher because it's unconscious. So data might enter the conversation, but data is not the lead-in in for the conversations. Um, would you like to add, Omar, to that? The only thing I would add is um, if a teacher brought the data, I believe we're capable of analyzing the data. But as Prachi said, we're not, that's not our primary focus, and a lot of times we'll let the teacher sometimes drive what, what, what they look at. And then I would offer, too, that data de depends on how you define data, because there's a lot of data that happens within an observation, but I would, I would guess in this, this question they're thinking about maybe test data, um, some of those types of things. Thank you. Um, there's quite a few open-ended questions on this survey, and that really um, drives a lot of the conversation at the end of the year. Um, Frida and I get together, uh, look at the data, and determine how we are going to have the equity coaches process it, giving them some prompts. And then based on that data, they construct their learner profiles of what do teachers need. Um, how do we need to move in order to move our teachers or engage with them? So, um, you know, like Mike was saying, we have been studying our model ever since ATPPS um, became part of the district, and typically we've done it through pre and post, um, beginning of the year and end of the year, um, but we are not able to really do an in-depth study of this model in you know, all its facets, the way it can be done. So although internal evaluation, which would be me, has its advantages that I know the context, I know the history, I have relationships, um, what it lacks is what an external researcher can bring in. It would be a different uh, perspective, different methodology, and we have been fortunate. We've, um, Dr. Mary Bussman, before she became Dr. Mary Bussman, wanted to study the district equity coaching model for her dissertation study. So she's kind enough, we're very honored for her to be here and share um, the recommendations from her study. There were also, there was also a study done or 
four studies done by four University of Minnesota advanced graduate um, level students under Dr. Big No's leadership, and we'll be bringing those results to you um, sometime in the future. Mary. So good evening, uh, Board Waters, uh, Superintendent Osai, and members of the board. Um, thank you so much for having me this evening. Uh, just a quick frame of reference. This is my 30th year in education, and I spent about 10 years as a building principal, um, most recently in Columbia Heights. As I went back to get my PhD, I started working at Equity Alliance Minnesota. Um, and so uh, my work at Equity Alliance has really informed also uh, my research. I um, want to start out by thanking Frida and Prachi for uh, granting me access to this work here in um, St. Louis Park. Uh, it's been um, a terrific learning journey. I'm going to kind of quickly go through the initial slides and then get to the recommendations and uh, some of the questions that you've asked tonight. You might also uh, hear some stories. I'll, I'll share a couple of stories from the actual interviews that I um, provided. Um, uh, so what I'm going to do, though, is before I, before I uh, start with this, I'll just give you a sense of uh, my literature review. I looked at implicit bias, and I looked at um, um, mindsets, growth mindsets, or closed mindsets, and how do we approach student learning. I looked at cultural responsiveness, and then I also looked at um, systems and leadership. And so if we were going to change, if, if anybody was going to change a school system, what was the leadership uh, and the support that was going to be required for that to happen? Um, I looked at adult learning theory. Um, I really looked at uh, for an adult to learn, they need to know. They, need, they have to have a why do I need to know this in order for an adult to step into the work of learning something new. They got to go, they need to know why. They want to be responsible for their own learning. They want to have some prior experiences. They have to have prior experiences connected to the new learning. So that has to be a part of what we do. Um, I've got to be developmentally ready to learn. So I can't start speaking third year French if I've not had intro to French, right? That's the same thing when talking about the language about racial and cultural equity. We can't start with talking about whiteness if people don't know that white is a color and experiences that go through that. Uh, orientation to learning and motivation to learn. And one of the important scholars that I studied was Zaretta Neal Hammond, uh, who said that for learning to occur, physical, social, and emotional safety have to be present. So that's part of the thing that the uh, equity coaches do. Um, I looked at what is transformative learning, and that is experience plus self-reflection through discourse. So it's talking about these disorienting dilemmas. And so when we do that, um, we have the opportunity to learn. In St. Louis Park, that dis the opportunity to engage in discourse happens with the equity coaching model. Um, I interviewed 20 teachers. 11 of those were secondary teachers. Nine of them were elementary teachers. Um, I interviewed seven of the nine current equity coaches. And I did this all of these interviews during the spring of 2017, so just a year ago. Um, and I interviewed seven of the eight principals, and I interviewed four of the district administrators who were engaged with uh, teaching and learning process. Uh, and then I did a qualitative case study. So I analyzed all that, all of those interviews, and I looked for themes and learning. Um, a couple of things that I, uh, I'm gonna talk, uh, some of the storytelling right now. And that is, in my findings, the first one that I learned is transformative learning happened through peer equity coaching. And a couple of stories that I want to share. I talked with a high school teacher, and just these were conversational interviews. And one of the things that I said is, when's the last time we, we were talking for about a half an hour? And I uh, just said, when's the last time a student told you to F off? And she said, uh, it's been a really long time. And it's because of my equity coach. It almost happened on Monday. A student was poking and playing around with another kid, and I said, you got to take a time out. And he looked at me, and he was really angry. This is a ninth grade student. He was really angry, and I could tell in my old way of teaching was I was going to poke the bear because I knew how to amp it up and get him out of the class. But because of my equity coaching, I knew how to give him space, let him choose to take the time out, and I gave him space at the end. At the end of the class period, I thanked him for doing that. 
And I thought that was the end of it. But she said, you know, as I reflected on it, I recognized also this was a ninth grade African-American athletic male. And I was monitoring all of those biases about what the world tells me about African-American males being violent. So I was calming myself in that moment and I allowed us to have that moment. And we both made our choices. That youth came back to me the next day, she said. And he said, Miss so-and-so, I stayed in class yesterday and I did my work. That's transformative adult learning through your equity coaching program, right? Another uh, fourth grade teacher talked about uh, helping a teacher plan uh, in the pre-planning lesson uh, about um, Washington, D.C. and how uh, Washington, D.C. was formed. So we were talking all about the French Pierre Lafont who uh, helped do that. And the equity coach said, how about Benjamin Banneker? What do you know about Benjamin Banneker? And the teacher said, I know nothing about Benjamin, ba Benjamin Banneker. The teacher went and the coach said, how about we meet again tomorrow? You do some research about Benjamin Banneker and we'll meet again the next day. They did, they came back and discovered that Benjamin Banneker was um, a man who had been enslaved, who knew math, he knew architecture, he knew drawing, and when Pierre Lafont got mad and left for France, he stepped in because he was his assistant, and he stepped in and drew out the plans for Washington, D.C. And the teacher came back and discovered and said to the equity coach, if I don't know about Benjamin Banneker, what else don't I know about? Why am I not teaching my kids the fuller story? And that was a transformative moment that led to deeper learning. Now the thing about that story is it doesn't stop there because when the teacher then told the fourth grade students that story, one of the white young boys said, now wait a minute, stopped class. And the fourth grade white male boy said, this was an African American who did this? We're changing history for 10 year olds. We're learning history differently when we teach the story differently. And that came out in that interview. So that's the transformative learning that when you're talking about, when, when we're talking about the four quadrants, what we're looking at, uh, those were some of the findings. The second was just that that discourse allowed teachers to learn. Uh, transformative learning also happened uh, across the district. People said that the language and the culture across the district changed. Um, that a second finding that I had is that the collaboration worked, yet there were competing agendas. In that, the, the amazing thing was that the teachers union and uh, administration agreed on the AP TPPS model, and what that would look like through equity coaching. Um, some of the complicating factors were there was still a little bit of an evaluative framework in there, um, and that in the fourth year, the year that I studied, it was a requirement rather than an opt-in. And that shift has happened, I think, in, for the district. Um, there was also a, a finding about the role of instructional coaches and the role of equity coaches, and trying to understand how do those two groups of people work together, or work, um, uh, how does an equity coach provide instructional coaching, and how does an instructional coach um, work through the lens of equity, and so discussion about that. Um, and then uh, disruptive individual leadership leads to change is what we found. And so then my recommendations that I provided and I met with um, Superintendent Osai and Frida and Prachi and uh, your Director of Teaching and Learning um, last May, I think it was. And so these were the recommendations that I found and presented. And the first is that coaching for cultural responsive teaching and leading uh, continue. Because, uh, and to, to really try to figure out how to integrate the work of the instructional coaches and the equity coaches. That adult learning theory uh, those components that I talked about with adults learning have to be grounded in this social and emotional safety. Because if I don't feel a sense of, you care about me, you got my back, I'm gonna be out of here and I won't be able to learn. So how we develop that sense of safety is important. Uh, increasing the one-to-one -one time. Both teachers and coaches both said that they don't have enough time with their coaches to talk about this stuff. Um, to explicitly define what do we mean when, when we're talking about culturally responsive teaching and, leading, uh, and learning, what's it look like? Can we articulate what that looks like? And so that model of the, the six teachers in each building um, 
could be a way that uh, that really gets fleshed out. Uh, and then to determine what does growth look like and who decides what growth look like in, a, in cultural responsiveness or cultural and racial competence. Um, that engagement at all levels in the buildings where the principals were deeply involved in the work, more teachers supported and the equity coaches felt uh, more supported. So that, that engagement had, has to happen at all levels. And uh, then the final thing was uh, a finding that I wasn't anticipating was that because the language of the district had changed in each one of the buildings, teachers of color felt validated, supported, and more willing to take risks because they felt like their white counterparts would get it. And that was a really interesting thing. So the support that this work does across the district for teachers of color uh, was really evident and to continue that. So, I tried to do that quickly. Um, do you have any questions of me um, in my research in St. Louis Park? Um, first, thank you for all that you've done here. I found the stories the most compelling because they brought it alive. You know, we've heard about this for years, but the stories really helped me understand deeper what's happening. So I thank you for those. I'd encourage you to come with a couple when you come back to us next year because it really helps me grasp what's happening. Um, is your research publishable? Is it shareable or are you not there yet? It's all done. Yes, so you can put in Google Scholar, Mary Bussman, Equity Coaching, and it'll show up right there in your, on the big screen. I just got my bound copy this week, so. <laughs> yes. Um, I too enjoyed those stories. I've um, been here for a little while, and I just haven't heard any of those, those type of stories to that degree mm -hmm. of uh, teachers actually changing and um, embracing this. So great, thank mm -hmm. you. I appreciate it. You're welcome. That. Thank you. So Mary, I want to thank you for this work. Um, I have had the honor of learning from you in my own professional development mm -hmm. through different opportunities. So um, I appreciate that you brought another lens of equity to our system supporting what I think I've understood all along, that it is supportive, not punitive. Mm -hmm. And um, my hope is that we are making bigger, faster strides, right? Once we have enough people who've kind of mastered the basics, yeah. the whole system's going to move faster as a result of this. Mm -hmm. is, is that what you're anticipating? Uh, yeah, uh, I, I'm going to share, can I share one more story with you? And, and it talks about that as we all talk about this. So one teacher uh, was an African-American teacher and said that um, she'd received an email from a parent and wanted, uh, wondered why the fall party was changing its emphasis, its focus in October. Uh, and the teacher went to her colleague, uh, her white male colleague, and said, would you respond to the parent on behalf of the team? Because we're shifting why we're doing this October party, but we're still having a party. And she said, two years before, even four years before, I never would have asked him that, because he would never get it. And so when he said to me, I understand, I need to send this letter this email back to the parent because you'll be perceived as the angry black woman who doesn't want to continue the um, tradition of how we do parties in St. Louis Park. And the teacher said he never would have gotten that four years ago. That's the cultural shift that you're talking about, right? Uh, the policy that you just passed earlier this evening, and you talked about shift is going to happen over time and there will be mistakes that happen over time. What the equity coaches are doing one-on-one -on -one with, with teachers are, the, are to be able to say, I messed up here. One teacher said, I messed up in this. I showed a video and the, the kids were just mad at me because it showed Latino kids in a bad light. And so she went to her uh, equity coach and said, what do I do? 
And the equity coach said, why don't you ask the youth? So she did, she went back and she asked the youth and they said, well, you could just tell us that it's about this topic and it showcases Latino students and the relationship happened, that kind of relationship stuff happens in all cultures and all races. So those are the things, you're exactly right, it's individuals being able to process with people they trust that will create that shift over time. And then how to do that so it's wedded with the curriculum, so that they're really digging into including absent narratives that are there. So like that Benjamin Banneker story, what else don't we know about? It's weaving those things together that continue to then shape and shift a system. Again, thank you so much. We appreciate your, your insights and, and the time you've spent with, with our system. It's going to get better. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you. I've um, appreciated studying it and really appreciate the leadership you're all providing for Minnesota. Thank you. Thank you for your time. <laughs> we'll see this on the Say action again? agenda. <sighs> Omni voviviparous. Check that one out. There will be a test on that at the end of the night. <laughs> the word viper is in it, so you know what it's about. You're on your next point on your agenda. We are on the next point of our agenda, the Children First Annual Update. Good evening. I'm Karen Atkinson, the Executive Director of Children First. I actually know all of you because every one of you has been trained in the asset philosophy. So I really want to thank you for your leadership and your support um, for this community-wide initiative. So. This past year, um, we added two new members to the executive committee. One was Superintendent Osai, and the other was Police Chief um, Harsey, who um, recently joined us. And actually, tomorrow morning, uh, we are having a summer intern join us. Kiana Robinson graduated from here two years ago, and she just finished her sophomore year at Hamlin, studying English, rhetoric, and minoring in communications. And she'll be helping us with community outreach. So the first thing she's doing is recruiting volunteers for the Parktacular Parade on Saturday. So we will see you there. I know you probably are going to be there too. So, And in fact, um, because you may be in the parade and miss it, I gave you each one of the Children First Frisbees that we will be handing, not throwing out to people in the crowd. If you know the um, rules of the parade, you're not allowed to throw things. So. So I just want to give you a little summary of what happened this spring. Spring's always a big time of year for Children First. And then some work that we're doing with our mission. So I think a lot of people in this room were at the Children First Champions Breakfast on March 1st. 350 people. We totally booked out the Doubletree Hotel. Um, it was a wonderful event featuring Van Hong, a young man who graduated from St. Louis Park. Um, he's probably, he's in his late 20s. Um, he was a Cambodian immigrant and talked about how much support he got from the community and the school, and in particular soccer, how soccer really paved the way for his success. And he and some of the people that he graduated with have started a nonprofit related to soccer. To them, soccer is really a lot about community building. There's the competitive aspect and all that, but the community building piece is really important to the young people that are involved in this nonprofit. Um, and we raised over $90,000 at that event, so that is amazing and shows wonderful support from our community. So in May, a beautiful day, it was Mother's Day this year. We had the 25th annual ice cream social. I don't know if you're aware, we ended up moving it because we realized it fell on a Jewish holiday and we do, a lot of our Orthodox um, Jewish friends come to the event. In fact, we got a thank you letter from one of them for the, Orthodox, uh, for the um, kosher ice cream that Byerly's donates to us. 
everyone else really enjoys the Sebastian Joe's ice cream cones, free ice cream cones. This year, we um, kicked off the event with the Children First song that was written especially for the 25th Annual Ice Cream Social. And this summer, a video will be previewed of that song, so watch for that. And we're looking for ways to get that out in the community. So if anyone wants to use it, we'll have it up on YouTube and be sharing that. Um, we served 2,600 cones this year, which is a lot of ice cream, and I know a lot of you scooped ice cream. <laughs> um, but actually, it was down a little bit. For a beautiful day in May, we would normally serve 4,000 ice cream cones. So we know Mother's Day. There was a Mother's Day effect there. So next year, we'll be back to the third Sunday in May. So it'll be on May 19th next year. So I also put in front of you our Children First um, mission cards that we worked on this past year. And um, the mission of Children First is to engage adults in St. Louis Park to actively participate in the growth of all of our young people. Um, as I think you know, not a, lot of commu not a lot of our residents are actually raising kids. Only 78% of our households are not currently raising children birth to 18. So only 22% of our households um, are actively raising young people. And so we are really doing a lot of outreach to get the word out um, to those people about the important role that they play in building strengths in our young people. So our goal is that by 2022, four out of five households will know about Children First and the important role they play in building strengths or the developmental assets that we're based on in our young people. Um, what I love about Children First and the school district is we really are married hand in hand. And I loved it when Frida said, in the tradition of putting our children first, which is right in the um, school district mission, but really when we think about the importance of building assets in our kids, um, it helps them achieve in school and it helps them become caring adults, which are really part of the school district mission as well. Um, so um, this summer, we'll be working with some of our key partners, the school and the city, to do even more awareness work and really looking at what are the things that are already in play where we can um, tie children first in? So for example, we'll be offering a community ed class this fall. We've talked to community ed about that. Um, I know kindergarten information night always includes information about the assets in the packets that families get. So really, what are those places through the school, through the city, through some of our key partners that we can just easily um, include children first in the messaging that they're doing. Um, we're also working with Six Speed. Um, they are a local ad agency, and they're gonna be helping us with some of the awareness work as, as well. So stay tuned, because they are fun <laughs> and have some really great ideas for us. Um, I think that's really about it, unless you have any questions. Nope. Karen, thank you so much for thank your dedication you. and work. We appreciate it. And, and thanks for um, including me again this year. Next up is the fiscal 19 budget discussion. Hi, I'm uh, Brooks Grossinger, the Assistant Finance Director, here to present our 2018-19 um, proposed budget. Uh, I'll start with the budget assumptions that the Finance Committee um, approved prior to preparing this budget. Uh, we'll look at the 2% um, state aid and also our enrollment holding steady. Those will be the two main drivers of our um, revenue for next year. And also take a look at our um, budget reductions, which are listed here. Um, and those would be the 
some overtime in the custodial department, um, some district office personnel changes, um, just some lowering of the um, classifications, some p open positions, um, the district office, non-labor. Um, then we have high school dean, a district professional de development coordinator, some instructional coaches, 1.3 FTE, um, a social worker voucher pay, that's your extra hourly pay, and then some special ed um, itinerant services and also some transportation costs. Um, those came up to roughly $500,000. I'm going to use this page summary of yeah. summary of what you'll find in the budget book. I'll start with our fund one general fund um, total revenue will be increasing by 1.9 million, roughly 3 percent to 63.9 with our fund one expenses increasing by 1.4 million, um, just over 2% to 64, 64 million 800,000. Um, the expense increase is, is, is strictly, almost all um, personnel salary increases, step increases, um, along with um, benefit increases, specifically health insurance um, was the main driver of that. So this comes out to, in Fund 1, the complete Fund 1, um, almost a $900,000 deficit spending for 1819. And that's kind of continuing, 1718 eight, here, we are in a deficit spending. This continues that at a lesser degree. So then taking a look at at our fund balance, anticipated fund balance, um, with both our 17-18 our budget, um, depends how that comes out with our audit and our final numbers, but we're looking at, I'll start with our, what we ended with last year, um, June 30th of 17 with our audit. Complete fund one fund balance was 18,688,000. Um, with our 1718 revised budget, we'd be down to 17 million two. And then with the proposed 1819 budget, um, not taking into account any budget amendments that might occur, um, we're down to 16 million four. When you look at the fund balance, it's it's broken down into um, four categories. You'll see there um, the unassigned, the assigned, the non-spendable, and the restricted. The um, the restricted, you'll see the categories there, staff development, long-term facility maintenance, uh, capital and basic skills. You have the non-spendable, that is our um, prepaid expenses, so that's a pretty steady, that's something we'll pay, expenses we'll pay this year for next year's um, items. So that will always have that amount. Um, our assigned, which would include our dental reserve, our ATPPS has a small reserve. Um, our literacy, we're also required to um, assign the following year's budget deficit into there. Um, and then, I'll, then finally our um, unassigned fund balance. So that would be fund one. Fund two, food service. Uh, that budget is coming in at 1.98 million in both revenue and expense, giving us a uh, projected fund balance of around 138,000. So they're operating at a um, break even. Community Ed is also in a similar situation, um, 7.37 million revenue budget and 7.36 expense budget, um, a fund balance projection of 1.09 million. Our next is um, fund six, which are, is our construction fund with the bond. Um, all the bonding revenue came in this, this last winter. So um, we just budgeted the anticipated spending for next year. Um, 
debt service fund seven will um, this is going to increase in 1819 due to the um, the levy and the new debt service payments so we're looking at 10 million 670 for revenue and seven million three for expenses these numbers come directly from the levy certification and also from our um, bond payments which will be made our bond schedules and then the last one is our technology levy um, that will have revenue and expense of 2.36 million and we have a fund balance a projected fund balance of 218,000 can I ask a question? Yes. Up at the top under revenue budget, the ATPPS, is that all the equity coaches or is that uh, specifically the, the they, funds dedicated to that? Or So I might not have this correct, but of the nine, I believe they pay four or five equity coaches. So this, that, the amount listed there would be for those four or five? That's what's included in their budget, in their expense budget. Okay. And that's in, considered part of the general fund? Yes. Even though it's dedicated to that purpose? Or we, we ass it, it's part of general fund. Um, it's an so whatever, if they have money, if they have a um, surplus at the end of the year, we assign that fund balance. I believe they have, it might be $100,000 that they've not spent over the years unassigned available. But their expense budget includes those equity coaches, and it also includes the, um, the teacher stipends that they determine if they meet their goals. But the revenue, the revenue does come in as, as um, gen ed aid through fund one. Even though it's restricted how we could use it? Right. Okay. It's, it's coded a certain way, both the revenue and expenses. Okay, and that's, and that's why it's listed separately? Correct. All right. It's assigned, okay. Anything else I could answer? Yeah, that's what I had. Uh, more detail for these numbers will be found in the budget book. If you're interested, it breaks it down by program code um, in fund one. So if you can't answer this here, that's fine. We can touch base after the meeting. Sure. Okay, Brooks. So I'm looking at your fund one, and I'm just curious, um, on the expenditure report, it looks like that larger number is due to a lot of, like, 12 million in bond projects. Um, we have a, the total expenditure went up by about 12 million, a little over 12 million, but we also have 12 million in bond projects. Correct. So, that's so, so we had the 100 million come in um, with the referendum. This is our anticipated budget for expenditures next year from that from right fund there. six the construction projects and then um, I noticed on the general fund unassigned um, went down uh, from one year to the to the current budget year by about two million and the total general fund went down about one million do you know what we're using the unassigned where the unassigned general fund went I would need to get back to you on that. I need a, um, a breakdown of our assigned fund balances, I guess. I don't have that with me. That's just um, The one I would mention is the long-term facility maintenance. You'll notice that was in a negative fund balance this year. Um, so we did, we did do some spending prior to the, the bond being approved um, with the idea that in 1819 we would underspend that using the deferred maintenance money with the bond to bring that um, fund balance back to zero. So, Aston, I think these are probably more for you, um, but if I'm wrong, just let me know. In terms of this budget that's being proposed, are there going to be any, uh, what are people going to see when they come to the school year in the fall? Are they going to see any changes because of this, changes in class size, changes in classes they're expecting? What's the impact? That the, if any, that the community may feel in the fall from this? Uh, Vice Chair Gorst, I appreciate the question. And um, 
I, I can't remember when it was, but we had when the financial advisory committee did their presentation, they um, shared their recommendations. And if you recall, the recommendations from a weighted average daily membership standpoint were consistent with the recommendation from last year. So we we um, staffed each site was staffed the same as it was staffed in the previous years um, previous year. Excuse me. So families, students won't see a reduction in um, teachers or an increase in class size. We, um, as you look at the administrative additions and changes to the budget assumptions this year, um, we looked at trying to reduce. So the Financial Advisory Committee suggested we should set a goal of around $500 to $700,000 for this school year to, or for next school year to try to reduce our budget. So we really looked at district level administration for that and other areas that were already a part of, it was really just redirecting dollars that as a part of our plan, we were not going to be um, bringing back positions. So I'll give you a specific example. For example, we had um, our director or excuse me our professional development coordinator retire so instead of adding another PD coordinator we redirected those responsibilities so we'll still have PD and we'll still do the work but we're just doing more work with less staff and what we'll do as we move into next year you know We'll, we'll work with the financial advisory committee. I think we were anticipating five hundred to seven hundred thousand dollars per year over the next three to four years. But um, as I'm looking at some of these early projections, I would um, my early assessment would be that we may have to increase that number a little bit. So um, it may require us to um, find other ways to redirect resources. And I'm just not sure at this time what that will look like. I know that they had also recommended. And it, uh, I don't remember what, did, did they name a number for the fund balance or was it like a, a prudent fund balance or there was a word, right? It wasn't, it wasn't defined. I, I, at the, off the top of my head and I don't have their uh, full recommendation in front of me, but they did, pr they did make a recommendation around a specific number. Um, and the, we'll, we will certainly work to try to maintain, uh, I don't know if the word was prudent or not, but a prudent fund balance, and that's going to be part of our redirecting of resources and trying to you know, find creative ways to um, slow down the, the spending of that fund balance. You know, as what we're talking about right here is nothing new. You know, this was part of legislative, this not only is impacting St. Louis Park Public Schools, but this is impacting us as a state. Um, I think, you know, um, Director Casey, last month when you gave the recap of the AMSD meeting, you, you talked about all of the things that were vetoed by uh, the governor in, in those bills. And one of the things that schools all across the state are looking for are some, is some support. Um, right now, our our revenue is not keeping up with our spending and when that happens we as school districts have to figure out how to either slow that down or to balance that out and I would say over the next couple of years we are going to have to take a closer look at our spending and, and get some of that in check. And a big one is our special ed cross subsidy and that was a number one priority for all school districts and we did not get any sway with state help on that. So uh, the state and federal government mandate it. They do not pay their full freight. And right now, our cross subsidy is 4.8 million and growing, and that's just St. Louis Park. So the needs are not going away. Our students who have special needs must be served. And so we're going to do that, but it comes at a cost and it comes at a premium cost. And, and until the state um, legislators start working together on resolving that we have to keep figuring it out on our end and not just our district every district uh, chair waters if I can just add one more thing um, and this is something else that's emerging and growing that will potentially have impact on our our general fund balance if if we don't come up with a workable solution but that is the unpaid meal balance debt um, I you know in, in Brooks I don't know if you can give us a specific number I know we're upwards of ninety thousand dollars I was gonna say in the eighties right eighties yep. of unpaid meal balance and um, we you know thankfully there was a you know we're working on different ways to try to generate revenue and strategies to support students because one of the things that we don't want to do is ever have to you know second guess or get into any type of discussion about not providing students meals we're going to always choose to provide students meals but with that um, you know comes a situation where as a school district 
um, where we're growing and have an emerging um, unpaid meal balance that could eventually impact our general fund if, if we're not attentive to that. Anyone else? All right, Brooks, thank you so much. Thank we you. appreciate your time tonight. All right, the next item on our agenda is the Summer Construction Project Review and, I got to get this right, and bid approval. Thank you, Tom Bravo. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I just want to first kind of let you know that we're ready to start our summer projects uh, for 2018. Of course, the big ones will start next year. But the, th the projects that I am asking for approval tonight are the deferred maintenance for the three elementary schools only. And um, we went through the process of the NP, uh, NJPA system because, uh, as you remember, we hired uh, Krause Anderson as our construction manager and also our contractor when, uh, when the bond referendum was approved uh, back in November. So what I'm asking for is the approval of the three projects, which they are all under the bid, uh, the numbers that we uh, estimated. So I'm, I'm proud to say that we are gonna be doing everything that we promised and everything that was required we had to do when we submitted the referendum to the state and to this group here uh, last last fall. So um, in, in, in short, we are going to be uh, doing uh, the security entrance at Peter Hobart. We're gonna be doing uh, all the classrooms, as I say classrooms, the mock classrooms for the elementary schools, and a lot of plumbing, mechanical, electrical, which I'm very excited about, so that we're moving forward for the bigger projects and not having to do those, and not coming back and saying, oh, we made a mistake. So we're ready to move, and the contractors are ready to start on Thursday with the cooling projects and the deferred maintenance projects, if approved. So this is just the deferred maintenance projects? This is just elementary deferred maintenance. We're not okay. doing anything in the high school, middle school, or central because of the fact that we're gonna be doing some big projects next summer. Okay, never mind. Tom, thank you very much, appreciate that. Thank you. The next item on our agenda is the ties resolution discussion. Uh, good evening, Chair Waters, members of the board. Um, the last time we were together, we made a request to rescind our letter to withdraw from ties. What you'll notice in this resolution language are some of the same points that were a part of our letter. I'll just highlight a, a couple of them. Um, as part of the resolution, you know, we as a school district maintaining our relationship with ties, we wouldn't pay any more than $20 per student, whereas previously, if we would have withdrew from ties effective June uh, or July 1, 2018, let's say, we would have ended up paying $44 per student, and I think at the time, the calculation was that it, it would cost us over $200,000 to withdraw from ties, where this um, is a much more manageable number. In this resolution, you see the language around, um, you know, up to $3 per student as it relates to uh, potential building needs and that this resolution also spells out that um, by maintaining our relationship with ties until the dissolution process that um, we would be eligible for, you know, any, it, any proceeds from the sale of the building, right? So I, I, I share this with you. There is no change in this resolution from the information that I shared with you last week, um, but we needed to bring it to the board for approval um, so that they can move forward with the dissolution process. Any questions? Nancy. So this makes financial sense and you're recommending it? Absolutely, okay. yeah. I And I don't have the numbers in front of me, but as I mentioned, Previously, we're saving upwards of $100,000 by maintaining our relationship with ties. Very good. Thank right. you so Thank much. You. All right. The next item is the SLP long-term deferred maintenance 10-year plan discussion with Tom Bravo. I'm back. Um, I'd like to just share with you, I don't know if you can see this, but... Um, the Minnesota Department of Education and the state require that we submit a 10-year long-term facility maintenance plan every every year with the revisions that 
to stay within the line of what actually uh, the revenues and expenditures of the, of the district. So what we have done is that we made some adjustments for 2018 based on what we are projecting based on the budgets of, uh, of revenue and expenses. Uh, so what you're going to see is in the long term facility maintenance mainly is we're going to be focusing, of course, on the health and safety portion of it, which again is a lot of things like the fire marshal review where um, those of you I was honored to tell you how we did very, very well. We were one of the safest districts uh, within the state of Minnesota based on the fire marshal, and that's just because of the money that we used from the long term facility maintenance in the past. Other things um, when, as we move forward uh, into air quality, uh, mechanical electrical systems of repair, uh, freezers, things like that. So the money that we're going to be getting next year on uh, this area will be mainly focused on health and safety and, and things that are, uh, around that, like playground safety and things like that. We are very fortunate because of the bonding projects, uh, we're going to be replacing a lot of old equipment and, and then we would ha won't have to use a, a lot of the long-term facility maintenance money until about four or five years from now. Any questions on that? Thank you very much. All right, next item is the Intermediate School District 287 Long-Term Facility Plan Request for Approval. Do you have anything, Superintendent Osai? Thank you, sorry about that, Chair Waters. Um, so as a, as a part of the 287 um, resolution for their long-term facility maintenance, I, I would say this is part of their, their annual long-term facility maintenance pro process and each member district has to have the resolution approved by their board for them to move forward. Um, I, I do believe that each of you have had an opportunity to to read the resolution and look at the projects. Um, if there are specific questions about any of those projects, I can try um, my best to answer those at this time. Anyone have any questions on this? Nancy, this is, do you have anything to add? Yeah, this, is, this is part of the routine of our relationship with 287, which really benefits our students who need those services. So absolutely, thank you so much. All right, the next item is um, policy development. First reading of policies 524, internet acceptable use, 806 crisis, and 807 health and safety. Um, everyone received these ahead of time. And um, I wanted to know, did Tom, you have anything that you wanted to share? for our special knowledge for internet acceptable? Thank you. Just quickly, the, uh, um, the changes that are in red on this, I believe, in, in talking with Cindy, are from the latest version of the MSBA policy. Um, a lot of it has to do with language around if you're seeking federal funding from the federal E-rate program or funding through the state of Minnesota through their telecommunication access grant program, you're required to do specific things such as uh, internet filtering, uh, by the uh, Children's Internet Protection Act rules, which we do anyway, and we do seek funding from both of those uh, sources. So um, that's a, a large portion of some of the uh, uh, additions to the policy, and there's some other uh, policies in there regarding uh, personal information and the sharing of personal information. So again, this is from the uh, additions to, from model policy. Um, when it comes to procedure, uh, we have the 524 procedures, which is something that um, we post on our website, but isn't necessarily something that the board has to vote on. 
the big change there is it was old language that was um, uh, prohibiting the use of personal devices in our schools, which of course we've been allowing for quite some time, especially here at the high school, allowing students to bring in a device. And, and so we changed the language around procedure around that. So um, those are a couple of specific things that are being changed. That was a very good synopsis with the key highlights. Any other questions, Ann? So along with the changing it to kind of reflect the current reality, mm -hmm. <laughs> um, I have two current realities that I don't think are in this policy. One is social media. And specifically, when, we, when the policy talks about access to certain things on the internet, it usually uses the term website, which is not the reality for most of kids and probably adults who are using apps to connect to the internet. And that's, where they're, that's, that's how they're um, communicating. So I'm just wondering if that is just not our current reality, if it is too specific. And yeah. you don't have to answer this right now. This well, I think it, I, I can answer a little bit to the social media, and I'm kind of looking across to uh, um, Sarah as well. Um, I think most districts, uh, if they've developed a, a, a policy around that, it's a separate policy um, from the acceptable use policy around social media. Um, when it comes to language about apps versus websites, um, you know, I, I'm not sure if that is tremendously impactful for what we're talking about here, but um, certainly could be added. Um. I guess the reason why I'm asking this is that I mean, a lot of what, our, what we hear from our kids that are using the internet at school or at home, um, on, but on the school, on school systems, I guess, mm -hmm. is that they're using things like Google Docs, mm -hmm. um, things like that, that are in the cloud. Mm -hmm. And so how do we kind of talk about what is acceptable use when we're talking about cloud-based or when we're talking about kids using personal devices at school, but that are not on the school network, right? Well, they all are on the school network. I mean, if they bring, if it, well, I, I should clarify that. If they bring in their, their smartphone and they're using their cellular service, they're not on our networks and they're not being filtered. If they, so they're we not do allow part of them our to, system then? We do allow them to join our network so that they do, if they're doing legitimate things for school and they're using them in their classroom, that they're not using their cellular service and eating up their data plans. They're using our Wi-Fi network, which is filtered by law because of the funding that we're seeking from the federal and state. But so That's, do we have an acceptable The student use? themselves has to choose what they're doing. We can't control, we can't force their device to go on our network. If it's a laptop and they don't have cellular, they don't have a choice but to go on our network. If they're using a smartphone, they have a choice. Uh, Director Casey, if I can, I yeah. think I get what you're asking. So you, what I'm hearing you say is that, so if a student brings their own device that's not connected to our Wi-Fi, which once it's connected to our Wi-Fi, subjects students to be, you know, subjects students to policy 524, and they're doing something inappropriate on their phone, on their own personal data, um, what recourse or how do we as a school district um, redirect, provide guidance, or is there policy to support that? And what I would say is that I certainly believe if a student's doing something inappropriate, it may fall under policy 506, right? And that, that, that a student is doing on their own personal device, but their own school property during school time, which would be a violation of maybe student discipline, or there may be a number, it may be a violation of harassment. I heard you reference social media, and they may be sending something via social media. So I, I would say that while I, I get what you're specifically asking for related to policy 524, I would say that where there's a gap, um, we have other policies that would be able to support. That makes total sense. I just kind of wanted to know what's the definition of our system? And what you're saying is the definition of our system is very specific. It's yeah. people connected to our system. Correct. And, and that, but that would include students who are using um, school-based, cloud-based, computing 
Correct. off school premises? Again, we have control. You use the example of Google, and we have our domain that we have control over what uh, we allow students to do within that domain. Um, if they log in at home on their device into our domain, we have some control over what they're able to do if they're off-site with that. Yes. Um, Tom, thanks for, well, I'm, there may be follow-up here to ask you to clarify. Sure. We do receive then federal funding. Mm -hmm. And so I'm wondering if you could help us, and if you can't do it now, the next reading is fine. But which one of these three alternatives then for this language that's in the policy, and maybe Cindy should help and confer on this too, would mm -hmm. be most appropriate for our district? Sure, we, we, can, uh, we can recommend one of those. Yeah, I, I don't have it right in front of me at the moment, but. Anything else? All right, very good. Thanks, Tom. Um, we also had the first reading for 806 crisis and 807 health and safety. Was there anything in either of those two policies that people had questions about? Uh, it says in Section B that the school district may form a health and safety advisory committee to be appointed by the superintendent. I'm wondering if we currently have one of those or if we have plans for one of those. Yeah, so I, I see Tom Bravo, our health and safety manager, walked out and out, and Rick was going to respond to the question. But too bad he's not here because he could have provided you with a robust yeah. explanation. <laughs> <laughs> so, so I'll do a shorter version. Uh, yes, we have, we have one. It, it's made up of... Tom Bravo, myself, um, union representation from all of the groups, and it meets monthly. And Nancy? Yeah, as I'm, as I'm looking at this with all the changes that have been recommended, I'm getting to part four, which is sample procedures included in this policy. And then they list a whole bunch of sample procedures, and then there's there's five that has miscellaneous procedures, um, um, and within that, D clearly doesn't apply to us. Um, so my question when it comes back to us is to ask the administration to advise whether we need four um, and what parts of five, if any, we need to be part of the policy when we move to adopt it. Because Yeah, we, we can, yep, absolutely, and we can certainly do that. Um, what we wanted to do is provide the board with all of the recommended MSBA um, changes for the first reading and then, you know, take guidance as we move forward for the next draft. Because, because I'm, I'm assuming what you would tell us is that we have a, a robust crisis management plan and we have notebooks and we have postings in the various schools and that we do training and, and that we've chosen whatever sample, you know, that the administration has chosen whatever sample procedures it wants to put into those various materials. Am I close to right? That is correct, yes. <laughs> Cindy? You are very close to right. And the, the section that comes at the end for, it's for assistance in drafting a crisis management plan. We do have a crisis management plan. That total is all MSBA. That we do not currently have any of that in our current policy. That's when when copying msba for your review that is part of their policy we do not have that whole section these are just references of where you where you can reach out if you need help uh, with your policy we we have in our crisis in our in our red books that we have in each one of our rooms almost all of these things that i have read through are included in that so i just wanted to point that out to you that you will not find that in our policy this is MSBAs Does that make sense almost because um, I, I'm not what I want to be clear about is what you're recommending that we adopt when this comes on for the second read and I think what you're saying is we don't need four and we don't need most of section five but I would like clarity when you come back to us on the second read correct so also what I'm referring to is starting on page 116 of board book that comes in after the cross references those pages also, um, I'll check with Mr. Bravo and Superintendent Osai, but 
I do not see those coming back as far as part of this policy. It's for your information at this time. And, and just so it's clear that that red book, it's right there in that room and every room I go in in our system has it posted. So it's, it's widely available. Show and tell. Uh, thank you. Share waters, I believe. <laughs> believe. Believing in show and tell, if the, I don't know if they can zoom in on me or not from the cable. Ah, see, they are watching us. This is the, uh, the manual that is our crisis uh, emergency action procedures, and it's in every, every, room. every room. So we don't want any emergencies, but we want to be prepared. Okay. Um, so then we are now ready to move on to policy development, um, second reading of policies, 528 student, parental, family. Chair and Waters, we skipped 807. Oh, I'm so sorry. Thank you. Uh, 807, health and safety. Did anyone have anything on health and safety? Cindy does, yes. What you see in the procedures, those are current, where it says health and safety procedural plan, it has Tom Morris, who is no longer an employee here, <laughs> so that needs to be uh, adjusted. Um, I need to also verify with Mr. Bravo that this is continuing, but that is our current policy, and it is posted on our website as a procedure with this policy. So just wanted to point that out. Very good, thanks, Cindy. Now we're ready to move on to policy development, second readings of a 528, student, parental, family, and marital status non-discrimination, 529, staff notification of violent behavior by students, 532, use of peace officers and crisis teams to remove students with IEPs from the school grounds. So this is our second look at these, and um, we are ready to um, move these on the action agenda unless there's anything else that people would like to see adjusted. It's an excellent uh, catch and change on uh, 528 based on our last conversation. And in Cindy on 529, I think you've told us earlier that when we adopt this, the note sections that are in red come out, correct? That's correct. A lot of red this night, tonight. So, are we up to 532? No one has anything on 528? 529? 532. So as I'm, this is a second read, so I would, you know, obviously the note part that's here in red would come out. Um, I don't, I would propose that we take out the section three that's definitions since but there are none in this policy and that instead we add to the second paragraph of the general statement of policy um, the words in accordance with school district procedures. So that sentence would read, corrective action to discipline a student and or modify a student's behavior will be taken by staff when a student's behavior violates the school district's discipline policy, and then add in accordance with school district procedures. I assume that we do have procedures in, in place, um, Superintendent, about what staff and, t and principals are supposed to do, and we're working on those? Correct. And, and, and section three sort of ref says we don't have, I mean, it references those, so I just thought we should take that out and ref reference them directly the way I said. And that is the language is sort of consistent with what we just did with the gender inclusion policy. So, so everybody knows where I grabbed that from. We're being consistent. That's good. Anything else on that? We are ready to move on to the action agenda. It is recommended that the school board approve the second readings of 528 student parental family and marital status non-discrimination, 
529 staff notification of violent behavior by students. 532 use of peace officers and crisis teams to remove students with IEPs from school grounds policies um, with Nancy's point related to the language about in accordance with school district procedures. Is there a motion to approve the second readings of these policies? Moved by Nancy, second by Ken. Any discussion? All those in favor say aye. Aye. Oh, okay, that carries 7 0. All right, next item approval of the ties resolution. It is recommended that the school board approve the ties resolution as presented. Is there a motion? Moved, Moved by Jim Benicky. Is there a second? A second by Ann Casey. Any discussion? I, I'd just like to say thank you to Tom Marble and Aston for staying focused on this and saving our taxpayers money by paying attention to the finer details with this so thank you very much for that all right all those in favor say aye Aye. opposed okay that carries 7-0 next item approval of employment contract directors 2018 through 2020 it is recommended that the school board approve the employment agreement between independent school district 283 and the school district's directors for the 2018 2020 school years as presented um, is there anything you need us to know about, Director Cryer? Um, if I could just speak to the three that you're going to do all at once. It'd be, um, these are very, very similar. Um, uh, we took the uh, director group, the supervisor manager group, and the professional group and treated them very much alike. Um, they have a general salary increase of 1.5% in the first year, 18-19 school year and a 1% increase um, in the second year, the 1920 um, uh, school year. Um, modest increase to health insurance. We've, uh, as we were talking about, we have been leveling up so that uh, food service people, Sparks people, CAPS people are getting closer um, to a one district um, health insurance plan contribution from the employer. So, um, you know, the, the directors and supervisor managers, professionals had a higher contribution already. So there was a, a, a small increase to the directors and supervisors, but much larger for some of the other, for some of the other groups. Um, minor change to deferred compensation for the professionals and supervisor managers. We increased it uh, from 2% to 2.25% match, uh, which is the same as the teacher plan. Any, all righty. So, question. Joe. So, just so we're uh, doing our due diligence here. So, this is a contract that includes you. So, just uh, could you talk about the process that you go through in order uh, to make sure that it doesn't, uh, so that it's above board? <laughs> so Thanks I'll just, say, much, I'll just yeah. say it that way. So, um, uh, all of the contracts run through the, su the superintendent. So um, the director contract is uh, uh, all of the, basically all of the cabinet, the uh, director level positions. Um, I do what I do for the, um, uh, all the other contracts as well. Um, in this contract, I do the costing. I bring it before the superintendent. We look at the placement of each director um, making sure that they're within the overall salary ranges and, and benefit plans. Thank you. All right, is there a motion to approve the director's contract? Moved by Mary Tombeck, is there a second? Second by Ken Morrison, any other discussion? Hearing none, all those in favor say aye. Aye. Okay, that carries 7-0. Uh, next item, approval of employment contract professional employee group 2018 through 2020. It is recommended that the school board approve the employment agreement between independent school district number 283 and the school district's professional employee group for the 2018-2020 school years as presented. Is there a motion? So moved. moved by Jim Benicky. Is there a second? Second by Ann Casey. Any further discussion? Hearing none, all those in favor say aye. aye. Opposed? Okay, that carries 7-0. Uh, 
Next item, approval of employment contract supervisor manager group. It is recommended that the school board approve the employment agreement between independent school district number 283 and the school district supervisor manager group for the 2018-2020 school years as presented. Is there a motion? Moved by Ann Casey. Is there a second? Second by Jim Benneke. Any discussion? Is there anything else? Um, yes, I, I just did the summary. So the, the, the supervisor manager, the professional group, and the directors um, each have virtually the same treatment. Um, uh, I, uh, the, the, there was an increase to the longevity m amounts for the supervisors and managers and professional groups um, that the directors don't have a, a similar longevity amount. Uh, but what we were finding was that some of the hourly group, well, all of the hourly groups, um, custodians, food service, clerical groups, had uh, like a $1.50 um, uh, career increment at 25 or 30 years, which um, was exceeding the amount of, of career increment that was in the professional supervisor group. So you could, in effect, promote and then go backwards. So we leveled up the... Um, 25 year, uh, the 20 and 25 year increments for the uh, for these groups as well. I was just going to make one other comment with the with these groups. We have all of our employee groups up to date um, for 17, 18, or 17, 19 contracts, and then these would be the 18, 20 contracts. Uh, the only exception to that would be the principals, which we still um, not because we're arguing, just because. They've been so busy they haven't had a chance to meet. So we, um, we hopefully will get um, the principal group caught up again. Um, and then we have a couple individual contracts that we hope to bring them at the next meeting. Very good. All right. Um, so we've got the motion and the second. Any further discussion? All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? OK, that carries 7-0. Next item, approval of Intermediate District 287 Long-Term Facility Plan. It is recommended that the school board approve the Intermediate District 287 Long-Term Facility Plan as presented. Is there a motion? Moved by Nancy. Is there a second? Second by Mary Tombeck. Any discussion? Hearing none, all those in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed? Okay, that carries 7-0. Next item, approval of the St. Louis Park Long-Term Deferred Maintenance 10-Year Plan. It is recommended that the school board approve the St. Louis Park Long-Term Deferred Maintenance 10-Year Plan as presented. Is there a motion? So moved. moved by Jim Benneke. Is there a second? second? Second by Ken Morrison. Any discussion? Hearing none, all those in favor say aye. 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 That carries 7-0. Next item, approval of construction bids for Aquila, Peter Hobart, and Susan Lindgren as presented. Is there a motion? Moved by Nancy. Is there a second? Second by Ann Casey. Any discussion? Hearing none, all those in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed? That carries 7-0. We are now at communications and transmittals. Anybody got anything? Parktacular Parade on Saturday. We're going to be in it. Okay. Are we walking or driving? I need to confirm that. I had an offer for a car, but I didn't really know if we were really going for a car. I know we had, Nancy had said that's car you can put the magnets on, so I just need to know are we walking or riding, or both. If, if we can still get the convertible, it's always better to have a car and walkers because you can put the magnet that says who we are on the car and so people know who we are and then we can take turns riding or draw straws or do whatever makes sense. That's fine. I'll let them know that we're going to have a car and walkers. Thank you. Thank you. The rest of us will be there and the people who miss out Next year is your chance, all right? <laughs> yep, Aston will be there. Yep, bring your kid, put him in the convertible. Well, maybe that's not safe on second thought. <laughs>
Jim Benneke. Uh, this week uh, on Wednesday, June 13th, uh, Principal Frank Johnson is having a retirement gig. It's going to be at uh, Susan Lindgren from 4.30 to 6. And I think they're having remarks at 5.30, if I remember right. That's right. And for those who remember, I'm at Peter Hobart. Uh, make sure you go to Susan Lindgren for this. Yep, Warren and I are signed up for cleanup duty at the end of it. Anything else? All right. Um, I would like to entertain a motion to adjourn. Oh, Cindy, what do we have? Would you like to announce that you're having a meeting tomorrow? Oh, yeah, good point. We are having a school board retreat from 530 till uh, we booked until 10 o'clock. Yeah. Um, but it's to, um, it's part of our retreat process. We're going to be doing professional development on racial equity. We are looking at um, what kind of space we'll be using after this year because this room will no longer be available. Um, the superintendent evaluation process, and I think there's one, and our planning calendar. So those are the items on the agenda. Thank you, Cindy. All right. Now, can we take a motion to adjourn? Moved by Ken Morrison. Is there a second? Second by Mary Tombeck. Any discussion? None. All those in favor say aye. Aye. With that carries 7-0 at 9.37 p.m.